This is Dimitri Lascaris coming to you from Kalamata, Greece on April 17th, 2024. I'm uh, pleased to be joined this evening by Leith Marouf from Beirut, Lebanon. Leith is uh, a consultant in broadcasting law. He is also a geopolitical analyst with particular expertise in West Asia. And uh, he's the executive director of a new media organization called Free Palestine TV, one that uh, richly deserves our support in part uh, because it's going to be reporting and has begun to report, in fact, from uh, the front lines of the uh, resistance in South Lebanon. Uh, Leith, why don't you tell us a little bit more about Free Palestine TV and how people can contribute, and then we'll launch into it. Well, first off, thank you for having me once more. Uh, I really appreciate being on uh, your shows here. Uh, Free Palestine TV is a volunteer-driven community television station um, that is funded through donations. Uh, we train youth here in uh, Lebanon in the universities to produce content in English, uh, so they can, you know, the audience in the rest of the world can know what's happening in uh, Lebanon in terms of resistance and, of course, the effects of this war on the people here. So you can visit our website, freepalestine.video, uh, to make donations. You can do um, recurring monthly donations or one time. But also you can visit us on Twitter at uh, TV Free Palestine, on Telegram, on Instagram. That's all also available on the website if you want to um, you know, subscribe to those channels. So uh, we are going to be talking tonight, we're going to be focusing on the extraordinarily dangerous situation uh, uh, in West Asia uh, as between Iran and uh, uh, the genocidal regime in Israel. Um, uh, I'd like to refer to it at times as the Zionist abomination uh, when I'm in my less charitable moods. But uh, before we launch into that subject, uh, I want to say a few words about Leith. Uh, some of you may know of Leith. Uh, he certainly has uh, a, he's widely known within Canada and outside of Canada, increasingly so for his vigorous defense of the Palestinian cause and his unsparing critiques of uh, the Zionist regime and those who support it in the Western world and particularly Canada. And the first time that Leith and I, I've known Leith for some years, but uh, the first time we did a piece together uh, was a couple of weeks ago when I was in the Bekaa Valley. Uh, and we had a really interesting and enjoyable conversation as we did something that was not at all enjoyable. We toured the destruction of civilian uh, targets, uh, very what appeared to be very much uh, civilian targets in the Bekaa Valley. Uh, and the subject we were talking about as we uh, surveyed the wreckage uh, was the attacks that you've been subjected to over the years. And you said something very interesting, uh, which I, I personally found quite compelling. I thought about it a lot afterwards, and that is that mockery, and this is what you've uh, done, which has drawn so much ire from the Zionist lobby and Zionist politicians, Mockery of Zionism and Zionists is kind of the only weapon you have, uh, particularly as uh, a Palestinian man uh, who uh, is deeply concerned about what is being done to Palestinian people and the complicity of Western governments in their suffering. Um, and, um, you know, if they take that away from you, what's left? I mean, you know, peaceful protest is going down the toilet. Certainly violent resistance is something that they don't tolerate. Um, and, you know, I got some feedback, interestingly, Leith, as I think you know, after we had that interview, most of it was overwhelmingly positive. I mean, it was really uh, quite uh, impressive how many people enjoyed the discussion we had, but some of it was negative and came from comrades of mine. Um, and I'm not going to get into the details of this now because it's really not the time and place. We will have other opportunities to flesh this out. I just want to say one of these comments I got was about some stuff you said, which uh, upset people in Quebec. We'll return to that subject, I promise uh, my audience, in another episode when we have more time. Um, but it, it occurred to me, you know, that's this person who made this comment to me about um, the controversy you've aroused with the tone of your commentary, uh, in particularly in Quebec. He, like me, is a man of European origin. And uh, I kind of thought to myself afterwards, who am I to judge? a Palestinian man, a man from the oppressed and brutalized population, speaking in his own voice, 
about the suffering of the Palestinian people. And I just want to get that off my chest. I, uh, you know, whether or not I would use your language is really beside the point. The fact is I'm not in your position. I come from a relatively privileged population. And uh, I think that those of us who care deeply about the Palestinian cause should cut some slack to our brothers and sisters in the Palestinian community in terms of how they go about defending themselves. So, Leith, I don't know if you want to say anything, but I just want to get that. Oh, off. you know what? You know what? Let's just go into it, actually. It's, it's actually a very funny thing, and maybe we can lighten it up from right from the beginning, okay? Okay, uh, okay so, so what had happened is that as the Zionists were piling up on me for my, uh, you know, criticism of them in 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 rude language, uh, they were isolated. You know, everybody even in that in 2022 was already beginning to, uh, you know, critique Zionism as the way we saw that the, the uprising in the Aqsa Mosque, the, the killings that happened at that time in 2022. And uh, so, but that wasn't catching in the audience in, in Canada. In fact, because the Zionists usually want to trigger the Nazis. They want to trigger the conservative ultra right wing, as we see in Canada, in their hate towards Arabs and Muslims. But really, the ultra conservatives in Canada are themselves hateful of Jewish people. So it wasn't catching. So what did they want to do? Uh, one of these Zionists managed to uh, pile, you know, compile uh, tweets that I've made uh, about Quebec and uh, took them out of all context and put them all together. And I'm going to put the context right now because it's a funny story. It's really a funny story. Uh, there, there is a uh, black rights activist in Quebec. His name um, is uh, Ricardo Lamar. Can I, can I just uh, stop you right there? Because I, I just yeah. want to... Because if we're going to get into this, I just want to then add one detail into what I said. And and when this comrade of mine, and I know that he had my best uh, my best interests at heart, and I, I I don't take exception at all to the advice that he gave to me. But he pointed out to me that you had used the word frogs. Oh yes. And oh, at yes. the time at the time that we had this uh, very interesting discussion in the Bekaa Valley, I was not aware of this. Uh, and so. Uh, of course, frogs is a term that's derogatory of French people in most contexts. Uh, one might say all contexts, but you uh, clarified to me after I received this information that you used it in a very particular context and didn't intend it in any way, shape or form as an insult uh, to Francophones and particularly to Quebecers. But I'll let you, with that as background, go ahead, please, and explain what, yes. what happened here. Yes, so there's a black rights activist in Quebec. His name is Ricardo Lamar. He's very famous. He uh, uh, took the CBC RDI to the uh, Canadian Radio and Television Commission in a complaint because RDI was insisting on using the N word on air. Okay, so he took the RDI, RDI to the. Just so people know, is a French language national broadcaster. In Canada. Oh, Canada. oh yeah. yes. So it's the own. CBC yeah, yeah. version, the French version. Yeah. It, uh, you know, CBC has a budget of $4.5 billion for our viewers. I don't know where this money goes. It seems like it's uh, it's a good funnel for uh, money out of the government. Point is, to get back to this, he took the RDI CBC to the uh, CRTC. And uh, after a big battle that we supported him at the Community Media Advocacy Center, where I am a consultant working on the files of racialized and indigenous uh, community uh, rights to uh, uh, employment and representation in the media in Canada, he took it, uh, you know, we supported him and he took it to the CRTC and he won. And it was a historic moment. The CRTC ordered CBC RDI to stop using the N word for any reason on air. Um, and that triggered a huge backlash against Ricardo from all these fascist French white supremacists going piling up on his uh, Twitter account using the I N word wanna... over and over and over again. So, I mean, uh, okay, so I, I, again, I'm sorry I interrupted you. I want to, because I did interrupt you, you just said, for those of you who missed it, 
that he was being trolled by people using the N-word over and over and over again. But yes. I, 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 to avoid any controversy here, any misunderstanding, Laith, I understand your view to be that uh, the vast majority of Quebecers are not white supremacists. Uh, would you agree with that? Of course, of course. Uh, you know, the vast majority are not white supremacists, like the vast majority of all uh, racial, I don't believe in race, but all cultural linguistic groups, uh, you know, the vast majority of human beings are decent people, no matter where they come from. Um, and uh, so in in as we uh, see Mac, we're getting calls from Ricardo and the black community saying, look, this is happening. Uh, you know, and I went and visited his Twitter account and I and I got livid, you know, seeing how, uh, you know, the thousands upon thousands of uh, people using the N word to attack him and they were. Uh, you know, say racist things against black people and, and denigrate them. So what I decided to do was to parody these tweets, okay? And yeah, take them more the towards- Were they in French predominantly? They were all in French actually, okay. because Ricardo is also is a francophone. He's uh, okay. so so he was he was on all the major French media in Quebec, uh, including the the uh, the flagship show of uh, RDI, that debate show with the audience. I don't remember what it's called right now. Um, uh, so I, what I did is I parodied these tweets that use the N-word and responded to them word to word with just switching the N-word to the word frog. Okay, Just to make people understand how racist they are being. Okay. And so this uh, Zionist troll, uh, once the attack started on me, compiled these uh, responses, these parody replies together, cut them off from what they were replying to. And at that point, my, my Twitter account was locked, okay? So this person shared it with the French media in Quebec, and they all claimed that I am hateful to French people, I'm racist to French people without any context. I tried, attempted to publish a response. I had access to a few of the tweets before my, my account was deleted completely. And no French media in all of Quebec uh, agreed to publish my uh, uh, reply. So I didn't have a right to reply. So here we have a person parroting somebody using the N-word is racist. Okay, but look at this. CBC RDI appealed the decision of the CRTC to the Federal Court of Appeal and argued that they have the right to use the N word. And they won in the Federal Court. The National Broadcaster of Canada can use the N word, and I cannot use the frog word on Twitter, and I will be piled up on by all the media in Canada for parroting the use of the N-word. So the, uh, you know, the, the, they've lost any, uh, they lost their mind. They couldn't understand comedy, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, satire, semantics. They call us anti-Semitic, but they're anti-Semantics, really. That's what they are. <laughs> you know, and so it, it is it's pretty hilarious. And I and I just want to say one thing out of context about Quebec nationalism. It is uh, to me as a Palestinian. OK, there's there's one thing to say French people, uh, you know, they're, they're not racist majority as everybody else. But Quebecois nationalism. It is uh, for me uh, something that is racist. And I think there is Quebecois uh, nationalism is the closest thing that you can find to Zionism within all the Western colonialist ideologies. Why? Because like the Zionist, the Quebecois nationalists claim that they were harmed by another white group. Okay, the English colonized them, okay? Like the Zionists say, well, we were massacred in the Holocaust. 
And apparently this oppression by another white group, the Germans in the situation of the Zionists and the Anglos in the situation of the Quebecois, gives them the right to colonize and steal indigenous land and claim it their own. This point of, oh, wow, we were oppressed by the Anglos. Now we have the right to expel indigenous people from their land, steal their 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 resources, uh, jail their their children, mistreat their women in the hospitals in Quebec. This is the problem with the Quebecois nationalism. Okay, and I think this is probably at the at the core of why even somebody who is claims to be a leftist Quebecois nationalist will pile up on somebody like me who is clear in their uh, positionality uh, against colonialism in general. Okay. So thank you very much for that explanation. Um, the part about, uh, you know, the context in which you used, I'll call it the F word, um, was known to me. Uh, you advised me of this after I got this comment, my friend, and we had that conversation in the Bekaa Valley. I hadn't heard this uh uh, view on Quebec nationalism before. And I think it's very interesting and provocative, and it's something that I'd like to think about. Uh, but I don't want to react to it now, first of all, because I haven't really... You know what? I've got another one for you about Quebecois. Where does the word Quebec come from? It's an Algonquin word. It means the place where the river narrows. And that's, by the way, the same uh, meaning for Deir Zor, where I come from in Syria. Deir Zor means the place that the, the river narrows. And so when a, uh, a French colonist in North America calls themselves Quebecois, what are they saying? They're saying, like the Zionist, that they are Semites, and I'm an anti-Semite. You see, the Zionist Jewish Europeans call themselves Semites is the same way as a French colonist in North America calling themselves Quebecois. Because it means that if this French colonist is the Quebecois who comes from the place where the river narrows, means the Algonquin people are not Quebecois. Are the, are the non-natives, you see? It is, it's, it's important to understand the power of words, even how identities are built on these words, which are a usurpation of, and, and, and adds to the usurpation of, of colonialism of the land. Uh, oh, well, thank you so much. I, had, I, hadn't, I didn't know that either. <laughs> I didn't know what the origin of the word Quebec was. That's, that's uh, quite informative. So. Again, I I would love I'd love to have a more expansive discussion with you about all these things, especially I've had a, after I've had an opportunity to reflect on what you've just said about Quebec nationalism. But um, there is a, a potential World War Three that uh, unfortunately merits our uh, prioritization, shall we say? So I'd like to move on to that subject, uh, and we will, I assure you, uh, for those who are listening to our conversation, return to these uh, these fascinating questions about Quebec nationalism and. Uh, colonialism in Canada. So uh, I'd like to start, uh, as I indicated at the outset, we're going to focus today, Laith, on uh, the the, the, the uh, increasingly uh, inflamed situation between Iran and Israel. And uh, I'd like to go back to what happened this weekend when Iran launched its attack uh, by missiles and drones on uh, the Zionist uh, colony. And uh, Please bear with me as I share with you and our listeners some sort of basic information about this attack, what we know. And there's a great deal we don't know, and that's something we have to be cognizant of. So according to Israel's military, Iran fired around 170 drones. I believe this was in Athens time. It was the early hours of Sunday morning. 170 drones, more than 30 cruise missiles, and more than 120 ballistic missiles. Um, and they say that with the help of the U.S., British, French, and Jordanian forces, they shot down 99% of the projectiles. 
Uh, Israel acknowledges that one air base, one Israeli military air base, the Nevatim air base was struck, uh, but claims that damage to that air base was minor. Now, um, let me just say at the outset, and I'm going to get into why I believe this. Uh, I think that that figure of 99% is a number that Israel's leaders just pulled right out of their ass. Um, why do I say that? It, 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 it is kind of the perfect number when you think about it, because as I'm going to explain, there are videos showing that some of the missiles got through. And so they can't say with a straight face it was 100%. I have no doubt that these people, given the, 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 the record of audacious dishonesty of Israel's military, I have no doubt they're capable of claiming with a straight face that 100% were shot down, but they can't because there are videos showing that some of these ballistic missiles got through. So they did the next best thing. They said 99%. But I think there's a lot of reason to uh, completely reject this as any kind of a serious number. Why do I say that? And I'm going to ask you to weigh in uh, when, I, when I'm finished, Leith. Um, first of all, uh, as the attack was underway, a uh, gentleman I follow on Twitter by the name of Mike Mikhailovic, uh, who is an engineer and defense technology specialist, posted the following. He said, at the best, this is before anything was known about the actual impacts of these uh, projectiles. At its best, Israeli anti-ballistic defense was able to intercept 50% of the first wave. The second wave is on the way. If they can manage 30%, that would be great. But if the third wave comes, anything more than 10% is a utopia. The problem is in the interceptors. Every ballistic missile needs optimal two interceptors to be neutralized. One interceptor can damage the missile, but if the warhead is not destroyed, it may well hit anywhere. Israel is burning their defense missile at a rate that will need the U.S. Air Force air bridge to replenish the stocks. One thing is sure, Israel will claim successful interception of Iranian missiles and drones in the highest ratio imaginable. The destruction of military objects is highly unlikely to be shown to the media. Now, I probably don't need to say, say this, but here's one reason why the Zionist regime would lie. If the Israeli population realizes that they cannot be protected from Iranian missile attacks, they may bail out of the country. I mean, they may rush to the exits. And so they have a strong interest to grotesquely exaggerate the degree of interception. And I think that should be obvious to any sensible human being. But then uh, after the attack was finished, about two days later, a gentleman by the name of Andrei Martyanov, uh, who I've been following for years, he is a former, he's an engineer, uh, attended uh, military academy in the Soviet Union, was a, a naval officer in the Soviet military uh, for many years, and then emigrated to the United States. And um, he's been commentary, commenting on and writing books about, very uh, interesting books, and uh, that challenge the orthodoxy about Western military superiority for a number of years. He's a published author. He put out a piece, he did a 30-minute uh, segment on the attacks on Jerusalem, and basically regarded as completely comical and beyond the credibility the claim that Israel had shot down 99%. So let's just talk briefly about the evidence before I turn it over to you, uh, Leith, what we do know. So if Iran fired about 350 projectiles and only 1% got through, that's three to four projectiles at most getting through. There is a third military expert. I don't know his actual name. He goes by the name Simplicius, he's on Substack. He writes very detailed and knowledgeable articles about military matters, particularly in respect of the Ukraine war. And he put out a piece a couple of days ago on his Substack, which have five to six videos showing somewhere in the range of 15 to 20 ballistic missiles hurtling towards Earth on a straight line and striking with a massive explosion uh, within Israel. I don't know whether some of these videos are uh, taken of the same attack, but from different angles. I don't think anybody knows for sure. But just looking at the video evidence uh, that's on his uh, website, and I suggest you read his piece about this, is extremely informative. It seems extremely unlikely that only three to four projectiles uh, got through. So with that as background, Leith, and you're on the ground there, and you had a, a very interesting discussion today, which I had the benefit of watching with the security analyst 
at Al Mayadeen. And you talked to him, and I'm sure you've had conversations with others on the ground about what actually transpired. What is your take on all of this? Uh, first off, uh, there was today a satellite image released of the uh, airbase that you mentioned, and it clearly shows, uh, I think it was five or six craters in the um, airbase. That includes the weapons, uh, um, you know, facility where they, they they gather their weapons. That includes a hangar where there was a uh, C eighteen, I think it's called the the cargo uh, plane, military cargo plane destroyed. It shows the command center destroyed and so forth. So the ballistic missiles actually hit their targets perfectly. Okay, and uh, there was, uh, you know, damage on the runways. Uh, those those missiles that were used on the runways are uh, fragmenting, so there will be many holes on the runways, and it's hard to uh, fix them fast. So this is one that we just saw, a uh, satellite image. There was two bases in the south, two air bases that were hit. One of them is where the F-35 squadrons are stationed. And that, uh, I don't think even the satellite companies will release to us. Uh, we don't know what's the damage. Uh, the third base is their main uh, listening post on top of Mount Hermon in the occupied Syrian Golan Heights. This is uh, the most advanced uh, listening um, devices they have and radars and, and electronic warfare and so forth that uh, from there, you could see Damascus, you could see Jerusalem from Amman and so forth, because it's one of the highest points in the region. And that was also destroyed. So, uh, you know, let's go back, step back a little bit. The Iranians uh, did a, a very smart uh, strategy. They had all these cheap drones uh, flying very slowly, very low. Uh, and, uh, you know, overwhelming all the air defenses between uh, Jordan and Palestine. And that was followed as all the air defenses are being emptied by these drones. It was followed by the cruise missiles and the ballistic missiles, which reached their goals. And that is the, a, a strategy that is very smart. It costs them so little to do. And, uh, and, and the Iranians stopped on purpose, because imagine if there was an actual second attack. The, there was no more interceptor uh, missiles. If there was a third attack, as you mentioned, and the uh, uh, interception rate will keep on going down, and then at that point, even the drones will reach their target. Right. It, was a very... it takes hours to reload these uh, these launch uh, vehicles for the uh, the anti missile missiles. Uh, so even if they had them in stock. Uh, these very expensive and sophisticated air defense missiles, they would not have been immediately available to meet another incoming wave. Yes, and also usually when you use these interceptors, you want to move them as fast as possible from the position that they're in, because if there's a second wave now, it's it's uh, you know targeted easier because they know where you've hidden it. So they would have had to move them to a different location as fast as possible so they don't get hit. And in that meanwhile, there's no air defenses. Uh, so the, the Iranians purposefully, you know, didn't, let's say, hit any of the American, French and British or Jordanian air defenses. The Americans installed the THAAD uh, missile defense, which is their most advanced one, and it failed to stop the ballistic missiles. Uh, but the Iranians hit, uh, uh, you know, Israeli air defenses inside Palestine in this wave also. Uh, so that shows you that, you know, we watched a video of uh, one of these uh, Iron Dome um, arrow uh, batteries shooting at a at a wave of missiles coming to it, and uh, then of course being blown up because it couldn't uh, keep up with the with the with the missiles. So yeah, ninety nine point nine percent point nine 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 percent. I mean, this reminds you of of elections in in uh, the Soviet Union or something like this. This is how ridiculous. It's like time has changed. We're flipped. It's now 
the axis of resistance and people in Africa and Asia that gives you the perfect number, and then the West has to exaggerate. Uh, you know, it's 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 uh, they humiliated themselves, uh, the Israelis, and I think. The only reason that the Americans threw out this uh, number and tried to exaggerate the success of the Israelis is to persuade them not to retaliate uh, and attack Iran. Because whoever, uh, there, there was an, a, a journalist in Yahradot Ahranot, uh, Ynet, is the most uh, widely uh, distributed newspaper in the Zionist colony, who wrote yesterday that uh, somebody inside the cabinet of ministers uh, meeting uh, told him that thank God nobody was recording this meeting because if the Israelis hear what was said inside this meeting, there would be 4 million Israelis running to Ben-Gurion to leave. Mm -hmm. And so if this is published in the Israeli newspapers, that tells you they knew at that point the Israeli leadership knew that if there is a full-out war, uh, all their airports will be destroyed. Okay, That's the only thing that Israel has left is air superiority. All their airports will be destroyed, all their air defenses will be destroyed, and then Hezbollah will just roll in and take, you know, liberate Palestine. The mm -hmm. United States will have to come in with military force on the ground troops on the ground to defend it. And this is why we see the Americans being scared of a full-out war in the region. And, and you know, I just want to add, I believe, by the way, that journalist, I, I, that statement in social media has been attributed, I don't know whether this is accurate, uh, to Mairav Zontheim, who I understand uh, is an Israeli analyst with the um, uh, the International Crisis Group. Now, I don't know if it, that was the reporter, but it it definitely has begun to be known uh, that uh, an Israeli minister made this comment to an Israeli analyst or journalist. In any event, I also should add uh, that uh, Colonel Doug Douglas McGregor, retired U.S. Army Colonel uh, uh, Douglas McGregor, has stated uh, openly that there is a cover up going on that this was far more destructive and damaging. And that's, uh, you, you, I highlighted uh, quite, uh, I think, uh, rationally, Leith, that that's another motive that they have to lie. If they, in fact, reveal the full extent of the damage, whatever it may be, and I don't think you or I can say with any confidence exactly what the damage is or even approximately what the damage is, but if it's quite significant and, they're, and they reveal it, uh, then how do they avoid launching a devastating or, or, or an attack on Iran a retaliatory attack that will not that will be met with absolutely devastating force. The only way that they can save face, if they're going to refrain from attacking Iran or limit themselves to some kind of symbolic retaliation, is to tell the public that this was a massive failure. This attack on Israel. Uh, if if it if it turns out to have been anything else, the pressure on them will be enormous to escalate and an escalation. And we're going to get into this in more detail, is likely to turn out very, very badly uh, for the Zionist regime. Uh, now, let's go into the whole question of what Israel may do next. Uh, and I want to sort of set the table by playing for you, uh, Leith. I, I'm, I'm sure you've read it, um, but um, uh, it may not be known to our uh, our audience. It is, I'm not read it, but I understand you actually watched live the proceedings at the UN Security Council when there was an emergency meeting relating to the Iranian attack. Is that correct? Yes, I did watch it, yeah. Okay, so for the benefit of our viewers uh, and listeners, I'm gonna play a one minute clip from the uh, presentation of the Iranian representative at the United Nations Security Council. I believe this was on Sunday after the attack. Madam President, as a responsible member of the United Nations, the Islamic Republic of Iran is committed to the purpose and principles enshrined in the Charter of the United Nations, reaffirms once more its commitment to the maintenance of international peace and security. The Islamic Republic of Iran reiterates its consistent position that it does not seek escalation or war in the region, while warning about any further military provocation by the Israeli regime the Islamic Republic of Iran reaffirms its unwavering determination to defend its people 
national security and interest, sovereignty and territorial integrity against any threat or act of aggression and to respond to any such threat or aggression vigorously and in accordance with international law. The Islamic Republic of Iran will not hesitate to exercise this right when required. Um, as a lawyer, it probably this is uh, tends to drive people in my private life crazy, but I tend to focus quite a bit on words and nuances and to constantly asking why did the speaker choose those words? He said the word any over and over again, any attack, any provocation, any aggression. And then after I saw this uh, presentation, it goes on for some 15 minutes. Uh, I've only shown a small clip from it. There was a report uh, in the Israeli media today that uh, in a phone call between uh, Iranian President Ebrahim Raisi and the Emir of Qatar, uh, Raisi stated the following, we firmly declare that the slightest action against Iran's interests will definitely be met with a severe, extensive, and painful response. I highlight the words slightest and interests. So he is setting the bar for a massive retaliation very low. And when he says interests, uh, it seems to me that he's not confining himself to an attack on the territory of Iran itself. Uh, it would obviously be contrary to the interests of Iran, for example, if Israel began killing more military personnel of the Iranian military in Syria. That too would be contrary to Iran's interests. Uh, so what I'm getting from this, Laith, and I'm quite interested to hear how you interpret all of this and what you're hearing on the ground in Lebanon, is that the rules of engagement from the perspective of the Iranian government have changed profoundly. And the strategic patience that they've tended to show in the past with Israel's relentless provocations, for example, killing Iranian military personnel in Syria, this will no longer be tolerated, not even uh, in the medium to short term. There will be an immediate massive response. At least that seems to be the message. Is that how you read all of this? Is that the world we're now dealing with? Yes, in a way. Um, but you see, the game right now is deterrence. Okay? So uh, Israel lost its deterrence through this attack by Iran. So, uh, and the deterrence is about Iran attacking Israel. So they, they need to regain that. That's what the Zionists want. They want to regain the, the, the power to deter Israel, uh, Iran from attacking them. Uh, attacking Lebanon or Syria does not deter Iran. So it is not really an option on the table for the Israelis if their goal is deterrence. So they will have to uh, attack Iranians, Iranian territory, uh, whether it's an embassy or not, or the territory of, of Iran itself. That's the only way that they can regain deterrence. And this is where the quagmire that Netanyahu and his cabal are stuck in. Uh, if they attempt to assassinate uh, Iranians on their territory or anywhere else, Iran is going to respond, and it's going to respond in, in kind. Uh, so I don't see them just attacking anything uh, outside Iran for the hell of it or attacking another part of the axis of resistance. They will have to kill somebody significant, Iranian somebody significant, or attack Iranian territory that is significant in ways to regain that deterrence. So up until then, it means Iran has the upper hand and it it uh, is not deterred. So that's the game. Uh, look at what's happening since the morning, by the way, here in Lebanon, just so our audience can understand the effects of Iran's attack. The destruction of the uh, observation base, the electronic uh, surveillance base on top of Mount Hermon means now that the much of South Lebanon and North Palestine is not covered in this surveillance work. I just, and, just pause there but again, because you and I know this, but not necessarily everybody listening to us will know this. Uh, Mount Hermon has been attacked repeatedly by Hezbollah in the past six months, uh, but not with ballistic missiles, I understand, but nonetheless, it's been attacked repeatedly because of its importance. And it is very close to the southern border of Lebanon. Is that right? 
Oh yes, it's on the southern border of Lebanon. Okay. It's, it's the wedge that the you know between uh, Palestine. Uh, it's the corner between Palestine, Syria, and and Lebanon. Okay. Uh, so they they you know what we've seen since the, that day is that more and more of uh, Hezbollah's weapons and drones are reaching their targets and deeper. Uh, we saw yesterday the Israelis attack uh, three different cars in Saida. Saidon is the largest, the third largest city in Lebanon. It's the largest city in the south. And they assassinated a brigadier general in the Hezbollah forces who's in charge of the uh, western sector in the south. His name uh, is Ismail al-Baz. Today I was in his, uh, we went to his funeral and and covered the, the funeral. And at, at, as we were there at the funeral, uh, Hezbollah attacked a uh, the headquarters of the expeditionary forces of the Israeli ground military forces. Uh, because Hezbollah destroyed all the front bases and the, and the secondary bases that are exposed over the last six months, the Israelis decided to hide in a Palestinian village in the Galilee called Arab, uh, Al, Al, um, um, I forgot the name of the town right now, but it's, it's, it's a, a Palestinian village, uh, Palestinian citizens of Israel that haven't evacuated because all the colonists evacuated. And the Israelis have been purposefully moving between these uh, Palestinian Arab villages uh, in the north to hide between them as a human shields because they know Hezbollah doesn't attack Palestinian villages. But today, Hezbollah made a exception uh, because of the assassination of the uh, commander of the Western section, uh, Ismail al-Baz, they flew in uh, attack drones that are very advanced and fired uh, these heavy uh, missiles on this base. And they just released the video a few hours ago. Unbelievable. The base is in the center of the village. It's, uh, it's, uh, there's a, a, a pyramid uh, kind of window on top of the base gathering place and they've covered it with a tarp the israelis and you see that from the camera of the drone whoo, it goes down right into that uh, glass dome and blows up the whole place there's uh, 18 israeli officers they were gathering for their command uh, orders and and also a car that was driving the the top commander of the of the forces was hit as it was arriving at the base. Uh, plus, in the video that Hezbollah released, there was three different cameras inside the village filming from three different locations inside occupied Palestine. Uh, so now, all this- can I, can I just pause there? Because I want to, I don't know if you're aware of this. I, I've been following uh, the Israeli media quite closely, the English language Israeli media. And before you told me any of this today, I saw a report in the Times of Israel that uh, Hezbollah had struck a community center. Uh, and that's the way it was described. There was no mention whatsoever in the Times of Israel report uh, that this was a military target. They did say that Hezbollah was claiming it was a military target, but they presented it as a community center that was being used by civilians. And they said 13 persons had been injured. Hezbollah then publishes its video. And by the way, that that initial Times of Israel report had a video of a drone strike coming in. Uh, and it looked like it did a lot of damage uh, based upon the trajectory and the speed of the, the drone. In any event, Hezbollah publishes the video that you're now referring to. And this is now the new report from the Times of Israel. Uh, the headline is Hezbollah publishes footage from drone attacking building in North. And the first paragraph, the Hezbollah terror group publishes footage showing its drone attack on a community center in Arab al-Aramshe. So again, that's Arab al-Aramshe earlier today, in which 14 soldiers and four civilians were injured, some of them seriously. Uh, so uh, 14 soldiers were injured. This so-called community center sounds to me like it was being used for military purposes. But uh, please continue. Yes, yes. And in the video of Hezbollah, they pause it. 
and they show you show you the tanks and the armored vehicles and so on that are gathered in the parking lot of this quote unquote community center. So uh, you know uh, it, it, it is a uh, surveillance uh, success. It's an intelligence success. It's a targeting success. It's a weapon success. 100% what, what Hezbollah did today, and it's a clear retaliation for the assassination yesterday. We will not know yet the names of those officers that died, but most probably they're very high ranking. There was intelligence that uh, you know uh, Hezbollah followed to you know do the tit for tat, equal uh, losses on the Israeli side. And this all of this would have been harder to conduct, have it not been for Iran destroying the uh, main surveillance uh, base on top of Mount Hermon. So uh, I think I'd like to turn next in the time remaining to us, Leith, uh, to I, the, the, the key question, uh, and that is, what is Israel going to do next? You and I talked about uh, how Iran might uh, respond to some kind of a retaliatory action by Israel. Uh, we talked about uh, the impacts of the Iranian attacks on Israel and particularly its military facilities. But um, I, I, I think the, the question that also ultimately is going to matter, and we're playing, we're having to get out our crystal balls here, polish them off and use our best judgment about uh, what this uh, abominable regime is likely to do. My own view, and I suspect you share this, uh, uh, broadly speaking, is that it's virtually inconceivable that this particular sadistic, diabolical, reckless, and outright insane regime is not going to engage in some sort of a military attack on Iran. I can't believe for the life of me, given its record, you know, you are what your record says you are. And the record of this government is one of uh, this regime and its military is one of extreme violence, recklessness, extraordinary hubris, a belief in its own inherent right to dominate others, and a kind of supercilious outrage at any suggestion that anybody could put up meaningful resistance to its domination and its depravity. So from my perspective, uh, there's no real question about whether it's going to attack some Iranian interest or target. The real question is, what will it look like? And will it be sufficient to provoke Iran into a truly destructive missile attack uh, on, or some other kind of retaliatory attack on Israel? Um, I, I, I'm, I'm reading reports today. I saw one in the Times of Israel that uh, David Cameron, after speaking to his counterpart, oh, ha he actually was speaking to Herzog, not, not the Minister of Foreign Affairs, but the President of Israel, after speaking with him, he came out and said publicly, um, you know, an, an Israeli response is inevitable without obviously giving any insight into what that might look like. Um, uh, I, I have difficulty even believing that this is going to be something purely symbolic. I just don't think it's the nature of the diabolical, sadistic Zionist regime to engage in symbolic retaliation. Um, oh, yes, because for every Zionist killed, they want to kill a thousand Exactly. Palestinians, as we see, they're vicious, uh, bloodthirsty. Um, but yeah, look, 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 you know, the attack by Iran, this is why uh, Cameron was in in, uh, in in Israel. And by uh, also Sunak tried to call Netanyahu, but Netanyahu refused to pick up the phone. This is in the Israeli media also. You know that. So, so the British and the Americans... By the way, what, 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 what do you make of that? What I make of that is that everybody is trying to calm the Israelis down because the British and the Americans are uh, screwed. They have uh, thousands of uh, troops sitting ducks in the Arabic world. This uh, The attack of Iran showed that they can carpet bomb all these bases and nothing can stop them if they want to. Also, it proved to us that up until now, Ansarullah have been on purpose holding themselves back and not sinking American and British uh, warships because they have the technologies that Iran has. So uh, in, a, in a situation where Israel forces a regional war, uh, it will be the first casualties will be American and British forces before anything else.
because the Iranians will not let these American and British forces have a chance to also join up with Israel in a in a in a regional war. Um, so and and you know the 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 naval base in Bahrain will suffer a bigger uh, attack than uh, Pearl Harbor. Okay, the American air base, uh, sorry, navy base in in uh, in Bahrain. So let's look at the options that the Israelis have. They have a few hundred uh, long-range missiles. Um, they can reach Iran, but they're you you know these long-range missiles are reserved for their nuclear heads. If they use them now uh, with with uh, just explosives, what are they going to do in the situation where they want to? bring a, a a nuclear holocaust upon humanity they, they so yeah. that's out of the question they those, can't are, those are the jericho missiles i believe is that right exactly the jericho missiles uh they don't have uh drone swarms like uh, iran has so they can't let's say send these swarms and overwhelm uh iranian air defenses and then fire cruise missiles or what have you mm -hmm. and the only option they have really is the f-35s but there's two problems with them. One is refueling them. Number two is that uh, although these uh, stealth planes are, you know, when when they're going straight, they're they're camouflaged. But if there's too many radars from all directions, one of them will surely catch you somehow. Uh, and definitely, when you fire from the stealth plane, it is revealed to the radars, and the you're, you're down. So it's a it's a one-way mission uh, for these F-35s. It's a suicide mission with no coming back if they use them. Uh, and even if they fire from outside Iranian territory, uh, they will be pursued by the Iranian air defenses from within Iran over Iraq or over the Gulf uh, mm -hmm. if they come from the Gulf. So they don't have much options. Uh, we don't know how they're going to do it. I, I personally can't imagine what they will do. And clearly they cannot sustain uh, and defend themselves from a counterattack by Iran without dragging the whole West in. And so maybe behind the scenes, the Americans will give them some technology, something that we don't know about yet, that will allow them. And I saw right now Biden asking the Congress to rush to allow him to send uh, thousands of uh, anti-air missiles to restock the stockpile of of the Israelis for their air defenses, uh, and and you know, but whatever he does, I don't think it's going to be enough. Uh, but you know, but we're all waiting for this Israeli response, and uh, you know, it's going to be a a, a nice uh, end of world uh, party that we were going to have to party with. You know? Regrettably, uh, Laith, uh, I must agree with you. I don't see that there's any good ending to this. There is a simple uh, way to put an end to all of this. And the simple way to put an all into all of this is for Western governments to stop shipping uh, weapons to the abominable regime. That would be the end of this uh, horror show. At least uh, they would have to stop the genocide in Gaza and they would not be able to escalate any further with Iran. Uh, but there's really no indication that the masters of the universe have the good sense to do that, to pull the plug on Israel militarily. Um, you know, we do have a few more minutes. Do you have a few more, more minutes? I, I, I did want to touch on one other subject. Um, sure. Uh, and it, it uh, I'll start by uh, repeating something that um, Andrei Martyanov, this is the, you know, the former Soviet naval officer who now lives in the United States, he's a published author and so forth. I referred to him early in our discussion, a uh, military expert, uh, very, very critical of Western militaries, by the way, uh, thinks they don't know how to fight a war. He said this, he says this repeatedly, and he's explained his position in great detail. They don't know how to fight a modern war against a peer enemy. Uh, and that's effectively what they're dealing with here. Iran at least from the perspective of missile technology and air defenses, according to Andrei Martyanov, is a peer enemy, uh, if not in terms of ground war as well. Uh, but um, uh, he says, as he said repeatedly, that uh, also that they have very, very sophisticated air defense systems in Iran, in Iran and quite a few of them. Uh, but in any event, the comment I want to highlight for you that he made is geopolitical in nature. It wasn't about military technology. 
And he said that he thought that the biggest loser in all of this was uh, Erdogan, the Turkish president. And uh, as he sees it, Erdogan has tried very hard for many years to position himself as the champion of the Sunni Muslim world and uh, the defender of the Palestinian cause. For six months, he's been shooting his, yapping his mouth off, making fiery inflammatory speeches while allowing billions of dollars of trade to continue with the abominable Zionist regime. And uh, finally, after his party apparently took a drubbing in local elections, he belatedly announced that he was imposing some trade restrictions on Israel. This all happened within the last few days. Uh, I don't know if it happened after the attack by Iran, but certainly it was very recent. And even then, even finally after he imposed trade, trade restrictions, his government stipulated that they would only remain in effect until a ceasefire. Not until the Palestinian people have a state, not until they've rebuilt Gaza, not until these heinous war criminals have been held accountable for their monstrosities, but simply until there's a ceasefire and then they're going to go back to doing business with the Zionist regime. Anyways, Martinov said that he has been completely discredited and that uh, he believes or assumes that as a result of this, amongst the Muslim and uh, Arab populations of this world, not just in West Asia, but elsewhere, uh, the standing of Iran has gone up enormously because they actually have, for the very first time, a state, not a, a resistance group, a state has openly challenged uh, Israel militarily. This hasn't happened in decades. And they appear to have done it and so far have uh, escaped unscathed from what they have done. And obviously, the whole world can see, whatever Israel ultimately does, that there is a lot of hesitation there. Uh, yeah, there, there, there's there's a lot there that you threw. Uh, yeah. One is obviously, uh, look, uh, after the 2006 war, when Hezbollah defeated the Zionist uh, invasion, that made the whole Arabic world, the whole Muslim world uh, stand behind Hezbollah. And that freaked out the West and the Zionists, okay? Um, and because the, the plan was uh, occupy Iraq, destroy it, then you destroy Hezbollah, then you destroy Syria, and then, you know, uh, Iran is left alone. And so that put a wrench in the, in the, in the, in the, plan of the United States and the Zionists. And this is why the United States, with the help of Qatar and Turkey, manufactured what people refer to as the Arab Spring. Okay, It is a colored revolution, uh, started first in two countries that are vessel countries of the West, Tunis and Egypt at the time, were controlled by two vessel dictators and a fabricated uh, movement in the street and media coverage of it was done uh, and a replacement and those two dictators didn't go to jail and walked out of with their money and everything. But the goal was to actually reach the republics in the Arabic world that are out of the control of the, U of the US, Libya, Syria, and Yemen, and to destroy them. And in, 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 in the same time, to create a schism between the Shia and the Sunni people, uh, because all the Sunnis were behind Hezbollah, the United States entering the war in Syria and bringing all these Wahhabi death squads from the Gulf and through you know through the borders of Turkey and the Muslim Brotherhood behind them, uh, you know, and Hezbollah entering on in the side of the Syrian military against the invasion by these Wahhabi death squads was the intention. The intention was to create a schism between the Muslim people, Sunni and Shia, and for Hezbollah, Iran, and Syria that are the, the main bulk of the resistance to lose the love and support of the masses in the Arabic world. And they, for the most part, succeeded the Zionists and the Americans. Uh, today, the actions of Iran, Hezbollah, uh, and Yemen, all of them Shia, okay, uh, being the forefront of uh, the military battle to support the liberation of Palestine and being the biggest suppliers of weapons to the resistance in Palestine, and the inaction 
of the uh, new sultan that uh, West was, uh, you know, proposing to guide you know, lead the Muslim world, Erdogan, his inaction to save the Palestinians uh, have now brought us back to the day of the, the 2006. Hezbollah right now has regained the love of the masses in the streets. Iran itself has now risen to fill the seat that uh, the United States uh, was preparing for Erdogan to, to sit in as the Sultan. So this is how much of a uh, defeat. They've lost uh, 15 years of investment in propaganda, 15 years of investment in war, 15 years in, of investment in sectarianism in the Arabic world, right now all erased. Okay, And uh, as we saw, Erdogan himself suffered Usually in the elections because of his, uh, you know, two-faced, uh, you know, behavior. I just want to point out to people: you and I talked about this in our discussion in the Beka Valley. You are not a Shia Muslim. No, I'm not a Shia Muslim. I mean, my uh, my mother's family are the Kilani family, who are uh, one of the biggest. Uh, their their grandfather Abdul Qadir Kilani has a tomb in. Uh, Baghdad, they're originally Iraqi also. Um, and uh, he's, he's considered one of the uh, biggest uh, theologians in the Sunni side. Uh, people from all the way Pakistan to Morocco come to pilgrimage to his, his, uh, his shrine. My father's family are mixed, uh, but actually don't really say Sunni Shia. The, my uh, my father's great uncle was the mufti of the Rizur and uh, the Jazeera, the uh, the land between the two rivers during the Ottoman years. He was a you know, su and he wrote uh, theologically there is no such thing as Shia or Sunni, and and so we we were more of uh, if this is my family. I am not uh, religious uh, in in that in that sense of. Uh, you know, thinking about these little details. I am faithful in terms of thinking about us all as the children of Adam and Eve, being all of us humans, understanding that uh, the most important thing about religion is how you treat others, okay? Relationships and how you behave uh, with others. Don't kill, don't steal, don't... And fight, fight injustice when you see it. And I draw on the powerful things that I have in my family's history uh, and so on that, that inspire me to continue to struggle for justice for those who cannot uh, get it. Well, Leith, it's always fascinating to talk to you. I learn a great deal. Uh, thank you so much for the conversation tonight, and I look forward to our next one. Thank you. I'll be with you again one more time. And this is Dimitri Lascaris coming to you from Kalamata, Greece on April 17th, 2024.